We have an int depth, an int x and y. We have x equal to 12 and y equal to 5. Um, and then I do width equals x plus y divided by 4. And I'm, what is the value stored in width after the statements are executed? So obviously, all that I really care about is this, right? Yeah? So how do I go about evaluating width equals x plus y divided by 4? Where do I start? You have to start at y divided by 4, right? Just like in C, order of operations matters. So what's 5 divided by 4? 1. 1. It's 1. Why? Integer. Because they're both integers. Right? 5 divided by 4 is 1. If it was 5.0 divided by 4, then it'd be 1.25. Right? Yeah? Okay? Okay, so we have 1 plus x. x is 12. Right? So width is 13. Pretty easy once you get that, right? Yeah? It's not 13.0. Well, it might be. <laughs> uh, 13 or 13.0 will work, okay? Yeah? Are we good? All right. Everybody's favorite, the theory questions. You will receive two of these at random. These are the exact questions that will be on the test. Okay? These are the only two questions that will be exactly on the test. Yes? Okay? So, the first one is actually three questions combined. <laughs> High level languages are either compiled, interpreted, or a combination of both. You should already know that. Okay? Explain how a program that's written in a compiled language is executed. So a compiled language, by the way, is just like C. Yes? Okay. So if it's compiled, how does it work? Uh, it just goes to whatever to the computer that you're on, right? That's that's true, but not really what I'm trying to get at. As opposed to an interpreter. Yes. That's right. So in a compiled language, right, you, the coder, have to create a complete document, right? Then that complete document is compiled into some sort of executable, right? Yeah? So it doesn't matter if your program is three trillion lines long, right? You type all three trillion lines, and then you hit the compile button, right? And then you get the, the, the thing that, that's compiled, or the executable, right? Is that clear? Okay, that's how C works, okay? How is that different than an interpreted language? So how is an interpreted language executed? So, in an interpreted language, you type a line of code, okay? The interpreter will take that line of code, figure out what it is in machine language, right? And then execute it, right? So, as you're typing, the code is literally executing on another screen, right? Each time that you type semicolon, right? It knows to interpret that, right? It's like a UN interpreter, right? Um, I say one thing, the interpreter interprets it and goes on, right? She doesn't know everything that I'm going to say. She doesn't know all seven trillion words I'm going to say in my lifetime, right? Yeah? Okay? So, interpreted is really line by line, okay? And there's benefits to this, okay? I'm not going to get into them now because it's not really relevant. So everyone understands that compiled, you type it all out, and then you hit the compile button, right? 
interpreted, you type one line, oh, it's going to do that one line, right? And then you type another line, oh, it's going to do that one line again, right? Yes? Okay. For those of you who have used, oh, there's a ton of them, uh, Python, Perl, JavaScript, PHP, things like that, Python, um, oddly, they all start with P. <laughs> but that's, that's kind of weird. That's beside the point, okay? Those are all interpretive languages, and you, you should know the difference, okay? Now, here's the hard question, and if you get this one, I'm sorry, okay? Explain how a, job, uh, how a program written in Java is executed. Isn't a complete document created, and then it's sent to the Java virtual machine, where it's translated into bytecode? Well, oh, you, you kind of messed up at the end, but you're, you're basically right. Okay, so let me explain this, right? Java is a, is a compiled and interpreted language, all right? What you do is you type out all of your Java code, okay? Then that is compiled into byte code, it's called, okay? It's all one word, by the way, byte code, okay? That byte code is machine independent, right? That can go everywhere. It can go on your coffee maker, it can go on your tablet, it can go on your PC, it can go on whatever you're, whatever you're using, all right? Then what happens is uh, the Java virtual machine spins up to execute it, right? Okay? So it takes that byte code and interprets it into machine code. So it interprets it for that individual machine. Okay? That's what makes Java compile once, right, and run anywhere that has a JRE, right, or a JVM, I should say, Java virtual machine. Okay? All right? So, in summary, when a language is compiled, right, you type out all of the code and it's all converted at one time. Yes? Okay? When a language is interpreted, you type out one line of code and it, tr it translates it all the way down and executes it. And then you type in another line and then it can do that, right? Okay? With Java, you compile into byte code and then that byte code is interpreted by the individual machine that runs it, okay? So it's like a combination of the best of both, both worlds and kind of the drawbacks too. Um, that's why Java runs so much slower, for instance, than C++, right? It's not noticeable in the programs that we've written, but um, it is a significant drawback and why, why not many games are written in Java. So everybody understand? You might get any one of those three questions, okay? Or you might get both. I get two out of those three. In addition to those, you might receive some of these other questions. Bonus! Explain the three types of errors that may be found in code. Include causes and when or how uh, errors are found. Okay, so what's, one, what's the simplest type of error? Syntax error, right? So what are, what are its causes? Yeah, so you've either got a spelling error or a grammar error, right? That's what syntax means, okay? How are they found? When you compile it, right? Yeah? Okay, it's found at compile time. Is that clear? That's the first type of error, syntax error. Okay, what's the second most complex type of error? Runtime. Runtime error, okay. Give me an example of a cause. Infinite loop. Infinite loop, divide by zero, yeah. Try to access something outside of an array range, yeah, something like that, right? Because it can't tell at compile time that you're going to do something stupid, right? Okay? 
How or when are those errors found? It's during testing. Yeah. So your hint is it's called a runtime error, right? They're found at runtime, right? Okay. Because, you know, 3 divided by n works fine 99.999% of the time. But when you enter n as 0 as your input, it bombs, right? Okay? Yeah? So that's a runtime error, okay? It's only found through extensive test cases. What's the most complex category of error? A logic error. Um, and how are, well, give me an example of that. Equals equals instead of not. Yes. So equals equals instead of, uh, instead of single equals, right? You know, or the other way around, right? So you do assignment when you mean to compare two things. That compiles because it's perfectly legal to assign something, right? Um, it's not really a runtime error because everything works fine, right? But it doesn't do what you meant, right? Um, another example would be... Uh, integer division? Huh? Integer division? Integer division, right? That's a good example, right? Um, because, again, it's legal. It doesn't throw an, it doesn't throw an error, right? But it doesn't do what you meant, right? Like we saw with 5 divided by 4 just a minute ago, right? Okay? How do you find them? You don't. <laughs> <laughs> you put it out in the public and wait for people to complain. Um, how are they found? Extensive test cases. So there's really no other way. All right? So, in summary, they are. Compile time or syntax errors are the same thing, okay? Runtime errors or logic errors, okay? And we gave you causes and how and when those errors are found. Okay, time for something a little bit easier. What is pseudocode? Well, we'll start with that. What is pseudocode? Yeah, it's just a way of expressing your algorithm, okay, um, in a way that doesn't depend on your language, right? So you just say what you want to do step by step. When or how should it be used in the software development process? Yeah, it's used in the design phase, right, when you're coming up with the algorithm that you actually want to run, right? All right, three more possible questions. What is the JVM and how does it work? Java, uh, JVM stands for what? Java Virtual Machine. The Java Virtual Machine, right? And it is just what it sounds like, right? It's not a real machine, right? It's a fake machine, right? Um, how does it work? Exactly. It, it takes bytecode and makes the machine language that that platform knows how to use, right? So you have to have a JVM or a Java virtual machine for every platform that you want to run on, right? Yeah? Whew. What are the characteristics of a high-level language like Java or C? It's uh, human readable. It's human readable. Uses algebra, right, and English instead of ones and zeros. Yeah. What else? What's that? Well, so are machine languages, though. You 
you do need a compiler or interpreter to, uh, to translate it into machine language. Is it platform independent? If I write C code, can I compile and run it on one machine and another? If I have the C code, yes. The problem is that you know, people who are writing software for money don't want to give out their, uh, their code, right? Yeah? So they have to compile it into machine language. Okay? So it's platform independent. It looks like English and algebra, right? And it's much easier to code in than machine languages, right? Okay? <sighs> Finally, the last one. What are the four different ways that flow of control can progress through a program? And explain each one. Start with the easiest. If? Even easier than selection. Sequence, right? Which means do one thing after the other, right? It's built into job, okay? Um, okay, what's the next one that, that we studied anyway? Somebody said it. Sequence. Oh, well, I guess we did talk about functions first, but we'll talk about sequence first, okay? So sequence, uh, I'm sorry. Selection is your if statements, your else's, your nested ifs, uh, and your switch, right? Okay? You don't have to know that for the test, but selection is just uh, choosing one path or another, right? Yeah? Okay? So we've got sequence, selection. What's the third one that you need for uh, to program anything? Repetition. Repetition. Those are your whiles, your do whiles, your fors, and your nested loops. Again, you don't need to know that for the test, but repetition basically, basically means do something again and again until some condition is met, right? Yeah? Those are the only three things that you need to be a um, computationally complete language. What's the fourth way that we talked about? Functions? Methods. Methods, yeah. So we, we just call them methods in Java, and since it's a Java class, you know. <laughs> but me functions are methods, okay? And that just means do something, right? Skip down to somewhere and then come back when you're done. Okay? That took a long time to explain. We ready to move on? There's only two uh, questions out, out of those seven or whatever, right? That I just went over that you'll get. It'll be randomly selected though, so I don't know what you get. Yeah? All right. Oh, good! More theory questions! But this time there's only four possibilities, okay? And out of these four, you will get two of them, okay? This is the stuff that should be new to you this semester, okay? How does an object encapsulate data? Not why, not what benefit does it, does it give me, just how. How does it do it? Okay, that's part of the explanation, but that's not enough. By restricting who has access to the information? Yeah, so, okay, so you make your data members private, right? So that nobody else can access them. And then you provide methods to provide access to that data, public methods, right? Okay? So you make your fields private, and you make your methods that want to touch those fields public, right? That's how it encapsulates it, right? And that's one of the big three advantages of object-oriented programming. What is the purpose of a mutator method? First of all, what is a mutator method? A setter, okay? So what's the purpose of a mutator method? To set a variable, yes? How should mutator uh, methods be named? Let's say that I have 
uh, a variable named, I don't know, x value, right? How should a mutator for it be named? Set x value. Set x value. Yeah? Okay. Let's skip the third one and we'll come back to it. What is the purpose of accessor methods? First of all, what's another name for an accessor? A getter. Okay. So what is, an, what is the purpose of an accessor? To get a variable, right? Okay. How should accessor methods be named? Yeah. Again, if I had x value, it would be called get x value. Woo! Complicated, right? Okay. The last one is, what is the purpose of constructors? To create an object. To create an object, yeah. What are the naming rules for constructors? have to have the exact same name as the class. Okay? Alright, um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to open a text file. you that this is going to be on the test. This is a 10-point question, okay? Notice that we have a class called theater, okay? Um, it has a private int attendance and a private string room number, okay? And I've got a series of other uh, comments in there, right? That's, all, that's really all that it asks. We're supposed to code the two mutators, okay? The value of attendance must be between 15 and 150 included. If the parameter is out of that range, set the attendance to 20. I don't know why, that's what it says. So that's what we're going to do. Don't ask me why. Use a conditional statement to validate. There is no constraint on room number. All right. What I would recommend that you do for all of these questions is first copy and paste the code. Ah! <laughs> Don't use Notepad. We're on six, right? Huh? Yeah, question yeah. six. Yes, this is question six. Skip. <laughs> I, I somehow skipped a seven. Sorry about that. Okay, so basically we've got a public class theater with a private int attendance, a private string room number, and the rest is all comments. All right? Okay, so we're supposed to code the two mutators. Let's start with that. Somebody give me uh, the uh, the header for one of the mutators. First of all, it should be public or private? Public. 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 Okay, because the whole point of this thing is to provide access to these private things. Okay. Uh, are mutators void, or do they have the return type of the variable that they're a setter for? They're void. They're void. Okay. I'm going to do attendance first. What is the uh, name of the setter for attendance? Set attendance. Set attendance. Yes? What does it take to the parameter? An integer. Int attendance. There we go. That's my first setter, right? Okay, what's the other one? Room number. Well, I know, but public <laughs> void <laughs> set room number. What does it take as a uh, string? 
Thank room you. number. It's training room number. As a priority. All right. All right, those are your headers. Okay. The value of attendance must be between 15 and 150 included. Okay, so we'll just do an if. Attendance is greater than or equal to 15, and attendance is less than or equal to 150. Remember that you can type this into your compiler, okay? So there's no, no excuse for typos. What do I want to do if that's true? Set the attendance to the attendance or yeah. the value. That so I'll do this dot attendance equals attendance. Yeah? Otherwise, I want to set it to 20, right? This dot attendance. equals 20. There you go. So if it's, in, if it's in range, we go ahead and set it to that. Otherwise, we set it to 20. Yeah? Whew. How about room number? No constraint on room number. Well, that makes it easy. This the room number equals room number. Everybody sees that the point of this is so that you can't set attendance to 12, right? Or 7,000. Yeah? Any questions about this one? Yours will be very, very similar. Different numbers, different class, different variable names, okay? But very similar might be an or instead of an and. Pay attention to the questions. Right? Okay. All right. Oh, yeah. Take a look at this answer. So I actually, another way you could do this is you could say if the attendance is less than 15 or greater than 150. Yeah? Then I want to set it to 20. Otherwise, I want to set it. That works too. Now you have to write a two string. Yeah. So um, code the two string method. Include a number format or decimal format object to format prices. Um, okay. The string return should be informative and professional. Okay. Nope. <laughs> All right. All right. So now let's public class rewards. I'm just going to put this here because it might be helpful. Private double reward price. I'm just copying reward level. Private string reward. Whoa, okay. All right, how does my two string start? Should be public or private? Public. What is its return type? String. And it's called two string. What does it take as parameters? Nada. Yeah? All right. So the first thing that we're going to have to do is we're going to have to make either a decimal format or a number format to format the prices. 
To format prices, you really should use currency, right? Okay. So you will have to import java.text.number format. Right? Okay. Now we'll, we'll have to make our number format. So let's do a number format. Um, let's, what do you want to call this? Let's call it uh, currency equals number format dot get currency instance. Okay. This should be plugged into your compiler, by the way. So, all right. So now I've got a number of uh, uh, currency formatter. So now I just have to make the string, right? So let's return. Oh, rewards. And I'll do. Uh, we'll end that. Then we'll do currency. Dot format reward price. Yeah. And I'll add to that level. And then reward level. Ta da! Yeah. We can even put price before this. Price. Right? So you know you're looking at rewards. The price is whatever the price is. The level is whatever the level is. It's another 10 points. Are we good? Hope so. You can see that here I use decimal format instead of number format. Perfectly acceptable. Uh, do you want the add override because you didn't put it on your other example? So would you be looking for that on the test? No, I won't. I won't be looking for any Java doc on the test. Good question. You can certainly put it there. I'm not going to complain. Okay, now this one is evil. Okay, this is the static question. It's not evil because I'm going out of my way to be evil. It's evil because it's just hard to understand. Okay? Okay, the question says, copy the code above to your answer and add a static variable to keep track of the number of memberships. Add code that will increment the variable when a membership is instantiated by a client class. Add a static method that will return the value of the static variable. Okay? Now, unfortunately, I can't copy and paste this. Isn't that great? So, I don't really have any choice. So, breed of dog, and, oh my gosh, private, double, average weight. Uh, private string, name of breed, uh, oh, okay. there you got a constructor, breed of dog, and if I don't pass it anything, I'm just going to set the average weight to 0, 0.0. It's a light dog. And name of the breed. To nothing. All right. We have another constructor. where we are passing in an average weight and a name. And we're just 
just going to set the average weight to the average weight, go figure. And we're going to set, we're going to set the name of a breed. name. Okay, that's our sample class. Okay? What is different about a static variable? Hmm? That's a constant. Yes, it's common, it's shared among all instances of breed of dog, right? Okay? Um, so, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to add that variable. So, private uh, int number of breeds. And I'll go ahead and set it to zero because I haven't made a single breed yet, right? Okay? Now, the key thing here is to make it static. Okay? That means that every time that I make a new breed, when I make Siberian Husky, right? When I make Chihuahua, when I make German Shepherd, right? I want to increment the number of breeds, right? Yes? Okay. Notice that if this weren't static, it would reset it to zero every time, right? Yes? Okay. But it is static. So what I want to do is in the constructors, I want to do number of breeds plus plus. Yeah? Because I just made a new breed, right? Even though it doesn't have a name, it doesn't have a weight, right? It's still a new breed, right? So I want to increment the number of breeds. But I need to do that in every constructor. Certainly if I pass it a weight and a name, then it's a real breed, right? Yeah? This is the constructor that I expect to use. So number of breeds plus plus. Okay, so that means that every single time that I make a new breed, I'm incrementing the number of breeds. That makes sense, right? Again, if this weren't static, the number of breeds would just always be one. That would be dumb, right? Yeah, because he's only one breed, right? But I want the number of breeds to be for all breeds, right? Okay. Now, it's said to include a static accessor, so you can get that information back out. Well, this is public. What's its return type? It's just an accessor. And what's, what's this going to be called? Well, I'm sorry. It needs to, it needs to be static, and, right? Yes? Get number of reads. And it just re needs to return the number of reads. That's all there is to it. Right? So when I haven't made anything, this will be zero. When I've added German Shepherd, this will be one. When I add Chihuahua, this will be two. Right? Etc. Makes sense. That's probably the hardest one on the test. But I hope it makes sense to you, right? It'd be really dumb to just have one for all of them, right? Because it only represents one breed. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. We'll do one more and then we're going to stop today. Uh, 
Okay, so we're doing the number of reads things thing again here. So I'm just going to erase the static stuff that I added to the previous example, right? And we've added an equals this time. I'm just copying this. Public boolean equals object O, o OBJ. And then we've got an implementation of equals. All right, so this is our breed now. Okay, so we've still got an average weight. We've still got a name of the breed, okay? Uh, we still got the default constructor. We've still got the argument constructor. But now we have an equals, okay? And notice this comment implies that equals is written. I didn't want to supply it to you, okay? Because I didn't want to confuse you. So this is the real chapter three stuff. In a client class inside the main method. Okay, so this will be uh, public, static, void, void, main, string, args. This is my main method, right? So this is inside the client class, okay? First thing I want to do is instantiate an object using the default constructor. How do I do that? Well, first of all, what's the class name that I'm instantiating? Oh, breed of dog. dog. I'm just going to call it my breed. Call it Scooby Doo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Gooby do. Surprise anybody who knows who that is anymore. <laughs> All right? And I'm supposed to use the default constructor because nobody knows what he is. Yeah? Okay? How do I use the default constructor? Help me out. New breed of dog. New breed of dog. And that's actually appropriate, because nobody, know, nobody knows what he is, and he's a fictional character, so he has no weight. <laughs> yeah? Okay, now I want to instantiate an object using the argument constructor. So I'll again do breed of dog. And I'm going to name this husky. Equals new what? The breed of dog. It said to use the argument constructor. Well, look at the look at it right here, right? I have to pass in an average weight and a name. Yeah. Huskies are about seventy point five six pounds. That's what mine weighs, anyway. <laughs> And its breed name is a Siberian Husky. Everybody with me? Okay. This is just like using simple name, right? All right, what are we doing next? Set the average weight of the object instantiated in number one. How do I set the weight of Scooby-Doo? Here we do. Dot what? <laughs> Set average weight, right? I don't know. He looks to be about 48 pounds to me. Nope, 48.7. There we go. Yeah? He's got to be heavier than that. Whatever. Doesn't matter. Give me a great name. <laughs> Nobody knows! <laughs> He's Scooby-Doo! He's his own breed. 
Okay, determine if the objects contain the same data, if they are print an appropriate method. And by the way, I gave you public static void main string args. So you didn't have to remember that. Okay? Okay, so how do I check if they're equal? If Scooby Doo. I don't know why I can't spell, spell Scooby Doo. Dot equals husky. Then I need to print out an appropriate message, right? System dot alpha print line. They are equal. There you go. I guarantee you that you won't have breed of dog. You probably won't have a Scooby-Doo. Just guessing. Um, the constructors will be different, right? It'll ask you to set different things. Um, so other than that, though, it's going to be the same. You guys did not enjoy this review at all. I can tell. Are you glad that we did it at least? Yeah. Oh yeah. All right. Definitely. So we're gonna finish this um, on Tuesday. Okay. Um, most of the questions outside of this are pretty easy, but um, so we'll finish this review. Um, also on Tuesday, we're gonna start uh, chapter nine. Okay. The one and only section. So uh, you might want to read 9.7. It's not very complicated, but it is one of those things that you'll want to look at. Okay? And then we'll just move on to chapter 10, which is the third uh, part of the meat of this course. Okay? Any questions? All right. Yeah, I got to get some today. I remember.